Wonderful. Can you hear me okay? Great to be in God's presence together and great to worship and love just taking communion, uh, uh, communion as a family as well and just blessed to be part of this church community. Uh, Martin um, uh, introduced this morning, we're working through a series, Anointed Messengers, and we're working through the book of Acts, which is found in the New Testament. If you're new to the Bible, the Bible's split up into two halves. You've got the Old Testament, which is all about the people of God before Jesus came. The New Testament is uh, all about the life of Jesus and the early church. So we're going to be looking in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Acts, which is all about the new church. And if you were here three weeks ago, you'll know that uh, Martin was speaking on Acts chapter 13 and 14. Uh, he, his title was Anointed Messengers Have a Big Vision. And he was kind of briefly touching on this missionary journey that two guys, Paul and Barnabas, are on. Well, we're going to focus uh, in a bit more depth in chapter 14 together. And um, that's where we're heading this morning. Have you uh, ever witnessed something miraculous in your life? Anyone? Something unexpected, something happens beyond the normal set of possibilities. When I think of the miraculous, I think of 2016. Being a football fan, um, that was a significant year for Leicester City Football Club. Back in 2014, Leicester City Football Club narrowly survived relegation from the Premier League. I think they'd won like nine games in a row right at the end of the season. So they just survived going down into the championship. And so when they started the next season, the goal was to survive, just to survive. Well, the 2015-16 uh, uh, season has gone down in the history books, being described as one of the greatest sporting stories, known as the Leicester 5,000 to 1 miracle. If you watch videos on YouTube, the commentators will use words like miracle and miraculous because they managed to defy all the odds. The 5,000 to 1 were the bookies' odds. If you put any money down on that, well done. Not advocate, advocating gambling, by the way, but um, they overcame all the odds. They overcame the uh, Premier League giants. I think it was 1995. Uh, before uh, it was the last time that a small club had managed to overcome the Giants. But for any football fans, they'll remember it as a truly miraculous event, an extraordinary moment. When I think of the miraculous, I always, also think of my brother. My brother, Will, um, he lives in York now. He's leading collective church there. But before uh, all that, he was, well, how can I put it? I'm going to be kind to him, but um, his, his sense of style his sense of style was interesting. He, when he was single, he'd roll out of bed, his hair was like bleh, and he'd just throw on clothes and off he went. And he was very spontaneous. So the term organization was not something that Will kind of operated in. And uh, he was kind of had a reputation for being a little bit kind of scruffy and unorganized. Well, everything changed the moment he met his wife, Elise. Everything changed. If you meet Will now, he's like, a really trendy hipster, fashion guru. Like he's one of these guys that will wear a, a, you know, like a winter beanie hat in the summer and it looks good. Like it doesn't make sense. And uh, Will is one of the most organized people I know. Like his Google Drive of all his files, he'll open it out and there's hundreds of these files organized. His diary is always really powerfully organized. For me, it is a miraculous event what happened to my brother, Will. Our title this morning is Anointed Messengers Expect the Miraculous. And we're going to read through Acts 14 and we're going to focus on two guys, Paul and Barnabas. And a bit of context is they're basically traveling uh, to different towns, different cities, telling people about Jesus. Sharing with people that have never heard about Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's done and what he can do for people. And... Um, they're tra traveling across uh, major Roman roads to big cities and different places, different, very diverse communities, some with Jews there, some with Gentiles, that's people that aren't Jews, some with Greeks, some Roman citizens. 
And so we're going to uh, read the full chapter of Acts chapter 14. So if you could put that up on the screen. And then we're going to um, unpack it a little bit and see what God wants to say for us 2,000 years later for TVC Church. Let's read this. At Iconium, which is a city, Paul and Barnabas went, as usual, into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among both Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and to stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lysonian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the gospel. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycinian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul they called Hermes because he, he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and reefs to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from those worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all the nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derbe. They preached the gospel in that city, and they won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for each of them in each church, and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. After going through Bethsaida, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Attilia. From Attilia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door for the, to the Gentiles. And they stayed there for a long time with the disciples. Wow, that was hard to read at the back there, but I did it. My first point this morning, anointed messengers expect the miraculous. The miraculous comes through being expectant. You know, as Paul and Barnabas were setting on their journey, traveling to different towns and cities, they were full of expectation. They were full of expectation for God to move once they arrived. They positioned themselves in faith. And as they would have been approaching, they would have been praying and asking God to move as they approached. Why? Because Jesus promised. Jesus promised them that they would see powerful miracles. Just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says these words in Mark 16. He says, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. 
They will place their hands on people who are ill and they will get well. So when Paul and Barnabas were approaching their city, they were full of expectation for God to move. You know, in their missionary journey, which lasted approximately two years, covering hundreds of miles, wherever they stopped, places like Iconium, Lister, Derbe, God did miraculous things. Signs, wonders, things that cannot be explained in the natural. Healings. The power of God was being demonstrated. I loved a few weeks ago hearing the story that Lucy Spate come and shared about her mum. She wrote that uh, my mum had been told she had a cancerous tumor in her lung. Very challenging to get that kind of news. And they, they, once they'd heard their news, they decided, well, we've got to get in prayer because God promised that our mum would have a long life. And they started to pray and to declare the promises of God over their mum. They went back to the doctor for the biopsy to determine what kind of treatment and when they arrived, they, uh, the doctor said, there's nothing to worry about. Whatever was there has gone. Well, the consultant and doctors said they couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain it. We can expect the miraculous because God promises it. He promises it. Yeah. You know, and some people need to experience the miraculous power of God before they believe in him. I mean, who was here last week when John O'Connor was sharing his story? This was a guy that's never been in church in his life. And somebody says to him, by the way, he's a heroin addict. He's in and out of prison. His life is a mess. Somebody says to him, hey, Jesus can set you free from heroin. And that was years before he decided to, one night in his prison cell, turn to God and say, Jesus, if you're real, come and change me. And he has a powerful encounter with God in his cell, and he's never tr touched a drug since, and his life's completely and radically transformed. How expectant are we? When you go about your day, how expectant are you for God to move? You know, God's desire is to demonstrate his power and ability to transform whatever area of our life God is concerned about. He's concerned about our health, our finances, our workplace, our family, our relationships. I was chatting with someone this week and uh, they were telling me they had to go uh, and visit a friend from another church and they had to go and talk to them and it was a very difficult uh, conversation and they were very worried and concerned about this. Anyone been in that kind of situation? And the likely outcome was that it was going to be an unpredictable, difficult outcome. But, you know, as they were traveling, they got themselves into prayer and expectation that if God's with them, then maybe something miraculous might be able to happen. So as they prayed and prayed and put their trust in God, they went and they had a conversation. And it wasn't a straightforward conversation, but they said, wow, I just felt God helping me so much. I could listen at the right moments. I could speak truth at the right moments. I could bring wisdom at the right moments. And it was a completely different end to how I thought it was going to be. God's interested in those kind of things in our lives. He's interested in our relationships. He's interested uh, in those things. I think about our journey moving from Stockton to Eaglescliff. God said to us, you to move to Eaglescliff. And we got in faith and if anybody's moved, moved house, it can normally go one of two ways. It's either really straightforward or really difficult. And we went, were in the camp where it was really difficult. I think we did about 40 or 50 house viewings to try and sell our house. It was relentless. And it was in COVID with two little kids trying to get the house ready every time. And you build up your sort of expectation. God, you can do this. You're going to open a way because you said we'd do that. And after about 50 house viewings, finally we got an offer. It was like, oh, great. So then we started to look for houses over here, and uh, <laughs> we started to put offers in, and we were like miles away. We were like right down the pecking order. The, most of our offers were like 20 grand lower. So it just felt like this impossible journey. We were never going to get over here. We are never going to get over here. And we, but we kept praying because we were expecting, because God promised it. God promises, and he delivers. So we kept getting in faith, kept pushing, and the house we ended up in, is amazing. 
it's like way better than any of the houses that we put offers in for. And we just, we were the first to view it. We had a great connection. There was a God uh, conversation in there that just joined us with the people that were selling. And um, they had loads of viewings lined up, but it was just too much for them. And so they just accepted our offer. And the estate agent said, no, 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 you need, to, you need to take more viewings. You can get more money for this. And it was like, God just went, there you go, guys. I'm going to provide for you, even when it feels like it's never going to happen. You know, we are to be an expectant people. We're to be the most expectant, the most faith-filled people on this planet because we've got a God who can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. And you know what? It might not come naturally to us to be expectant or to be a faith-filled person. When I grew up, I was one of the half-glass empty types. And I would be... I would pride myself on being the type of person that would be able to tell people why something won't work. I mean, it's not a very good thing, that, is it, when you think about it? I'd be really good at looking going, hey, this is great, but actually it's not going to work for X, Y, Z. And so everything that came out of me was a lack of faith and lack of expectation. But over the years, and this is the point when we follow Jesus, we don't just stay where we are, but where we are, but God's got a passion for us to keep moving forward, keep developing, keep growing, keep expanding at whatever point we are in our journey following Jesus. And over the years, as I've seen God move, as I've read his word, God has completely transformed me in a way that I'm full of expectation that if something is God's will, I know it's going to happen. Like, I don't question it. So when people say to me, oh, you're going to do this, I just go, okay, if God's in it, it's going to happen because that's what God does. You know, we express our expectation and our faith in God through prayer. Every time you pray, you place your expectation in God's hands. And so that's why having prayer as a regular part of your, your uh, week is really important. One of the things that I try and do is have a rhythm of prayer in the morning and prayer at the night. And prayer in the morning is normally devotional, word-centered. Prayer in the nighttime is normally about thanksgiving and about intercession. And so at the end of the day, instead of carrying our worries and concerns into the next day, we just bring them before God and we declare the promises of God and we declare that God, if you are in this, you can move, you can make a difference. And I'm trying to cultivate a heart of expectation. And uh, we've been praying for a friend uh, from another church and we've been praying for them normally on a night time when we make our lists. And uh, they've been going through some significant health challenges. They were told by the doctors that they're going to uh, need some lifelong medication. They'd had some tests and had extremely bad results off the charts. And it was a very difficult outlook for this person. But we got praying. They got praying. They called people to pray. They went back to the doctors and uh, the results were completely different, like radically different. And the doctors were gobsmacked. And they said, what have you been doing? What have you been doing? It's not right. What's happened? And all the person could say was, we just got praying. We got praying. The miraculous comes when we're expecting in prayer and we bring our situations to God. Paul and Barnabas moved in the miraculous because they were expecting. They had faith that God was going to move. And maybe some of us are here today where walking through situations and circumstances and we're struggling, we're feeling a bit half glass empty. God wants to fill us. He wants to fill our cups so that we've got faith and expectation. Whatever we're facing, God can move. He can make a way. Look through your Bibles. Read any story full of situations and circumstances where it feels impossible and just God just goes, boom, makes a way. That's what God wants to do. So that's number one. The miraculous comes through being expectant. Number two, the miraculous comes through God's anointing. Paul and Barnabas are traveling hundreds of miles, sharing the good news of Jesus in different cities and communities. The first city they come to uh, is Iconium, which is a busy trade center up a Roman road. And it says this, it says, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. They spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the other Gentiles and poisoned their minds with the, against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there. 
and it says, speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. If, you, if we would have been there and saw Paul and Barnabas, we would have seen the anointing of God all over these guys. They rock up into this city and they start speaking and so many people are, are convicted. They start responding. The anointing of God is all over them as they're communicating. They then face some opposition and backlash and God goes, okay, I'm going to demonstrate my grace here. And signs and wonders and healings start to break out. But it says that the, his grace enabled them. It was his grace. It was his anointing. It was his anointing. It wasn't Paul and Barnabas' anointing. Then there's a plot to stone them in Iconium. So they flee from Iconium to Lystra, which was a Roman colony about a day's travel from Iconium. Uh, in fact, it was the place where Timothy, that we read about in the New Testament, he was from Lystra, who Paul mentored. But Lystra was a completely different city. There weren't many Jews there at all. There wasn't a synagogue. There was no mention of evangelism in the synagogue. But there was a temple and statues to Greek gods, and many of them spoke a different language. So a completely different missional context. But in Lystra, they found a guy, a guy who had been lame from birth. So everybody knew this guy. When you walked in the city, oh, that was the guy who's lame from birth, and all he does is beg and stay where he is. Very similar to the story and healing of Peter at the beautiful gate that we read about earlier. And they pray for him. Paul prays for him, and what happens? A powerful miracle a powerful miracle where this guy gets healed. And the local people who were speaking a different language thought Paul and Barnabas were divine. They thought they were Greek gods that have come down and they're gathering people, they're excited and they're like, right, let's get some sacrifices and go down to the temple and start and honor and worship and acknowledge that these guys have got an anointing, that they are divine. Paul and Barnabas were really clear that it was God who did the miracle, not them. It says, but when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We're bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. Paul and Barnabas were desperate for these people to understand it was the anointing of God that brought the healing, not their own ability. From Lystra, they uh, head down to Derbe, which is about 60 miles from Lystra, where there's loads of new disciples getting made. They're preaching the gospel, and more and more people are coming to faith. So in Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, the power of God is being demonstrated. People are coming to faith. People are getting healed, and God's demonstrating is power. You know, even in our modern day culture now, we love to put people on pedestals, don't we? We love in our celebrity culture to always lift people up. And the people in Lystra, as soon as they see something happen, they think, wow, this, the, the gods have come to us and they lift people up. But Paul and Barnabas are clear that it was nothing about them to do with this extraordinary event. It was clear it was God's. You know, church, I love the richness and diversity in this room. God has blessed us with anointing upon anointing in this room. As I look around, so many people carry a particular anointings for different things. So when some people pray, it's like the anointing of God just breaks out and something gets released. Or people that just have a gift and anointing to make people feel welcome and cared for and loved. Or you find people that just have an anointing of administration. Or working with people, they just carry this ability and anointing. And, um, you know, one of the things that God wants to remind us all this morning is that it's not about us, but it's about his anointing. It's his anointing. And it's important that we remind ourselves and remember that so that we don't fall into the trap of thinking it's our ability or it's to do with us, Right? You know, when I was younger, I used to, and I've shared this story before, when I was younger, I used to get these horrible night terrors. And in this night terror, I used to get pursued, and they'd, these things would get a hold of me, they'd rip my voice out, and I'd cry out for help, and, and nobody would come because they couldn't hear me. And in, particularly in my teenage years, it felt like that, that night terror became a reality in my life. And it felt like my voice had been stolen from me. 
And it's not a kind of like awkward teenager that struggles to talk. It felt like my voice had been stolen. I felt paralyzed when it came to communicating in any kind of context. I became gripped with fear. And any time I tried to speak it, like somebody had my throat and was going like that and squeezing it. And I couldn't speak. I couldn't get anything out. And so every time when I'm speaking in any kind of context, I think back to those years and I think, wow. God is able to do miraculous transformations. Like wherever you are at today, God can move and make a way. God can do things where you think, I'm just, this is the way I am. I'm not going to break beyond this. And over the years, I've had powerful encounters with God's Holy Spirit. And he hasn't just given me my voice back. He's given me a new voice full of power and authority and anointing. It's nothing to do with me. It's his anointing. And so God wants to remind us this morning, just as Paul and Barnabas with, the, with these guys saying, it's not about us, it's about him. It's about him and what he wants to do. Paul and Barnabas traveled back to the mission headquarters in Antioch. Uh, Antioch and it says, on arriving there, they gathered everyone together and they reported all that God had done. All that God had done. Not what Paul and Barnabas had done, but what God had done. You know, God is going to use us in powerful ways, church. Like, he's going to use us in powerful ways. We're going to preach the gospel. We're going to see people respond. We're going to pray for the sick. They're going to get healed. We're going to see people's lives transformed. But let's make sure that God gets the glory. Let's make sure when we see the power of God demonstrated, we go, thank you, Jesus. We give you the glory. In your workplace, when the favor of God and anointing of God is on you, give him the glory. Whatever area of life it is, Jesus promised we're going to be fruitful. He says, if you remain in me and I in you, you're going to be fruitful. It's a promise of God. So in, in our lives, we're going to be fruitful and prosperous. But let's give him the glory. Amen. Okay, last point. Point number three, the miraculous comes through courageous perseverance. As we've read the text, you'll notice as Paul and Barnabas traveled to different places, some people received the gospel and some people didn't. But more than that, these guys experienced incredible opposition. In fact, fleeing from dangerous situations became a way of life. Became a way of life. They experienced hardships, challenges, oppositions wherever they went. They had to flee from Damascus, Jerusalem, Caesarea, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, to name a few. We read that in Lystra, enraged Jews had traveled many days coming from Antioch and Iconium to find Paul and Barnabas. I mean, that's the kind of dynamic. So this, uh, it's about a 90 mile distance. People would maybe travel 20 miles in a day. So you've got a group of people that are so enraged and so uh, focused on traveling somewhere to wipe out Paul and Barnabas. This is the kind of stuff. So you've got God doing these amazing miracles, signs and wonders, but then you've got this incredible opposition, incredible uh, challenge and hardship. But I think that one of the key things that enabled Paul and Barnabas to move forward is that as anointed messengers, they handled all of this with courageous perseverance. You know, it says in verse 21 that they returned back to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So if you'd been beaten up to the point where people thought you were dead and left you outside the city, would you go back to that place? Put your hand up if you've had the courage to go back there. When you look at this, it's just so evident that these guys were anointed with something. They had an anointing from God that gave them a supernatural ability to push against opposition. Like opposition that would overwhelm everybody else. But they have an ability to courageously persevere and keep going. You know, being a Christian is not for the faint-hearted. Being a Christian is not for the faint-hearted. What's the symbol of Christianity? It's a cross. Is the cross a nice thing? The cross is a form of being killed. That's our symbol of our faith. Jesus told us in John 16, 33, he said, hey guys, in this world, you're going to have trouble and hardship. You're going to have trouble and hardship. 
Paul says that we're going to uh, endure many hardships to end, enter the king, kingdom of God. I'm reading through 2 Corinthians at the moment in my daily Bible readings. And I read this this week. This is Paul, the same guy that we've read about. He says this. He says, uh, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. It's clear that Paul understood that being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, meant that that he's going to experience some opposition and challenge. You know, if we look around the world in many different nations, the term persecution means something completely different to what it means to living in the UK. Put a picture up on the screen. This is a lady called Sahar. She's from Iran. And uh, some of her story is she came to faith. Uh, She was given a Bible by somebody in Iran and she started to read it and discover Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus. And she received Jesus into her life. Well, the consequence of that was her non-believing husband kicked her out of the house. And they had children and they kicked her out of the house and she wasn't allowed to see any of her children. That's pretty hard, right? I mean, that's, that's brutal. She pushes into God. She pushes into God in prayer and draws close. What happens next? The authorities come and find her and put her in prison. And she spends five years in prison for being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus. But she has courageous perseverance about her. And she knows that if God is with her, then all things are possible. And so she continues to put her trust in Jesus And as she comes out of prison, God's worked in her husband's heart in such a way that he brings her back into the family. And they manage to flee into Turkey. And uh, you can watch videos from Sahar, but she's there telling these stories about how she's discipling people, discipling many Muslims that have come to fear from different countries. And God's using her. She's a really powerful leader. You know, there are many times where she could have given up where she could have stopped and said, you know what, maybe following Jesus is just a bit too hard. But God wants to give us courageous perseverance. Put another picture up. This is Maureen Martin. Very recently, Maureen Martin was a candidate to be a mayor in one of the boroughs in London a few months ago. Well, she was sacked uh, because she believed in a biblical view of marriage between a man and a woman. And she faced great shame and opposition from people and she got sacked because of her biblical view on marriage. She could have given up. She could have just said, okay, that's it. But she didn't because she had courageous perseverance. And she went to court with the help of Christian concern and in the end, the court battle was won. In the end, she won the court battle. This is what she says. She says, I know God brought me through this situation. And I cannot emphasize more the importance of Christians taking a stand when being discriminated against. It was chilling what happened to me, but I am now stronger for it. Much of our culture is now anti-Christian and believes that biblical beliefs, especially on marriage and human sexuality, are hate speech and therefore are illegal. And then she finishes by saying, I will absolutely be standing again as mayor, uh, mayor candidate in 2024 in Lewisham. My message will not have changed. You can fire me, but you cannot silence me. Like, what a woman of courage. Come on, it's great, right? This is in our country happening now. We, at different times in our walk, will find ourselves in battles. We will find ourselves where we're going to experience opposition. And it will come in different forms, different challenges, different hardships, because we're in a spiritual battle. You know, Paul and Barnabas saw a huge amount of fruit over the two years of this missionary journey, like seeing people come to faith, seeing people healed, seeing new churches established. And, uh, you know, it would have been amazing to see that happening. God was uh, miraculously moving 
but it was also in the context of extreme opposition and trial. I want to say, church, whatever you are facing today, don't give up. Don't give up and don't back down. Never forget who is with you. Paul and Barnabas courageously persevered, not in their own strength, but through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. If you read through the New Testament, Paul writes this. He says, when you come to Jesus, you don't just get um, your life tidied up, but it says you become a new creation. You become a new person, and all the old stuff gets thrown away, and you get given a new life. And the outlook of life is completely different. He also writes in Romans 6 verse 10. He says, the same spirit that rose Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. The same spirit that defeated death itself. It lives in you and me. I mean, if we could get a hold of that. Powerful. By definition and by nature, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are an overcomer. Because you've got an overcoming spirit living inside of you. So when you're facing the battles and the opposition, remind yourself, the same spirit that rose Christ and led lives in me. So I can have that courageous perseverance to keep putting one foot in front of another and keep getting expectant for God to move. Whatever situation you're facing, God wants to empower you. He wants to give you an ability that is beyond your natural ability to keep pushing forward courageously. Many of you will know that Abby, my wife, experienced three years of depression. And uh, that was a very challenging time for her. She got miraculously healed by God uh, from the depression. But then very shortly after that, she had another, she had a health scare to do with her ear and her neck. And there was a suspected tumor there. And it felt like another opposition, another battle. And we had to get in prayer and we had to get in faith. And I remember speaking to um, somebody in this church that was an audiologist. And they said, yeah, I was really concerned about this. This did not look good. But we got in faith and we prayed and God moved. And everything was fine. And then there's another thing. After that, she has another health scare. She gets some high test results. She has some symptoms that aren't consistent. And she has to go for a colonoscopy. And this thing that feels overwhelming and feels really big as the potential of after a digestive disease or even at worst cancer is another battle, another opposition, another opportunity to back down and say, oh, let's just take things easy. But as we step forward in and through the anointing of Jesus, we move forward in faith. And we do not get struck down, however hard or however challenging things are, because God is with us and God's for us. And as we prayed, God moved, and we came back with the all clear on that. Praise God. Which there's been three kind of like health challenges, mental health, physical health over the last few months, and it's thinking, what's going on here? We're in a battle. God wants, God wants so much for us, but the enemy wants to pull us back and slow us down and stop us moving forward. And we need one another to be praying for, praying for each other in all that we're facing. But we need the power of the Holy Spirit if we're going to be courageous in moving forward. So church, I want to encourage us this morning. Whatever situation we're in, whatever we're walking through, God wants to move miraculously. He wants to do stuff. And he can do stuff. And I want to encourage you uh, this morning to maybe make a step of faith this morning. To say, okay, I'm putting my trust in you, God. I'm going to put my hope in you, God. And we want, we'd love to pray with people this morning for anything. Health challenges, financial, relationship challenges, whatever it is, we believe that God can move. Because that's what he does. Amen? Okay, and we're going to have the band come back up. And we're going to just use this, use this song just to uh, open up our hearts. And then uh, Martin's going to lead us from there.